next speaker is Rico Zenklusen from ETH. Sorry. First, uh, many thanks to the organizers for, for the invitation. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. And so I would like to talk about uh, a special type of integer programs we can solve efficiently. And this is joint work with, with Stefan Ardman and Robert Weismann. Yeah. So let's start uh, from the very basics. So it's just a standard integer program with objective C, constraint matrix A, right-hand side B. And all of them I assume to be integer. And so, so the, the diagram to the left, you see, um, uh, you see the uh, the linear program in relaxation, the blue set, uh, so we optimize not over the blue set, but only the integer points in there, so there will be the red dots in there, and the green set you see here is just a, the convex hull of uh, the integer points. So I'll call this also the integer hull. So there's, um, uh, of course, there's many, or some, some classes of programs of ILPs we know how to solve efficiently, in particular if the number of variables or constraints is constant, or, um, uh, or another very important class is if the matrix A is totally linear modular. So again, totally modular means that, that uh, any, any square minor of the matrix is, there, is either minus 1, 0, 1. So any minor is minus 1, 0, 1. The minor mean a determinant of a square submatrix. And the reason why this is the case is pretty, um, uh, is pretty direct because if the matrix A is totally modular, it turns out that the relaxation, so the blue set, coincides with the green set with integer hall. And you can just solve the LP and return a vertex solution. And that will do it. Uh, it's very important for. Uh, it's a pretty relevant case in combinatorial optimization. So one could wonder, as I said, so t-units means that minors are bounded by one uh, in absolute value. So is there anything special about one? So one thing that's certainly special is that blue and green coincide, as I said, but it turns out there's an, an open question or conjecture in the integer programming community about uh, whether you could solve IOP still efficiently, even if, if a matrix with still bounded minors, but maybe not bounded by one, but bounded by a different, say, a constant maybe even slightly super constant. And so it's clear it's kind of a, this, this minor, this highest top term is kind of a, of a way to interpolate between the TU case and the general case. At some, time, at some point, things will get hard. So this latest happens when the, when the minors are n to the epsilon for any constant epsilon. This can probably be improved, but it's just something that follows immediately from existing, uh, existing problems that are NP hard. And so far, so good. So today I would like to talk about the bimodular case. So you, can, so you can think of this as the case where the minors are bounded between minus two and two, but it's actually a bit more general. And I wanna, I wanna really present the result in that generality. So it's again, integer program, but I only require that the n times n minors, so minors containing all of the columns, that they are between minus two and two. Uh, furthermore, I need that the rank of A is, uh, that A is a full column rank. And actually one can, it's not hard to see that this case includes the, uh, the case of, of all minors being bounded between minus two and two, of course, without the assumption of rank A equal to N. So it's not, I mean, it's not immediate. There's like matrices with that property that, that don't have this property, but one can easily uh, reduce any ILP over such a matrix to an ILP, to a bimodular IP. So I would call this bimodular IP simply BIPs. So you see an example of how this could look like, such a problem, and then 2D. And of course, now the relaxation can be, can be half integral. That's some, uh, so it's not immediately obvious how to, um, uh, how to derive integer solutions. Okay, so the main result I wanna to show today is that actually you can solve such bimodular integer programs efficiently, even in strongly polynomial time. And so I'll start some comments and give you maybe an example of what you, uh, how you can try to build up some intuition for this bimodularity, um, or, or at least for, for having small minors. So we will show that, that this BIP is, um, you can reduce it to a kind of a TU, a totally modular ILP, with an additional constraint of parity type. Then we will use Seymour's TU decomposition to decompose that, that TU matrix into, small, into simpler blocks. So we'll go into those details in a, in a second. Uh, so even if this sounds a bit confusing, I will, I will um, uh, try to enlighten uh, these parts soon. Uh, a crucial tool we um, uh, use by using Seamus theory decomposition, we break the problem down into simpler problems, and those problems can then be interpreted combinatorially. That's kind of an important step we have, uh, we, we, we use here. And the, then we need combinatorial procedures to solve those, and the procedures we need are like parity constrained combinatorial problems. And actually, one of the main tools we use is parity constrained submodular minimization. So that's the, the task is to minimize the submodular function over all subsets that have odd cardinality. And it turns out that's one of the few classes of constraints of model minimization for which we know how to solve them uh, efficiently. 
Good. Okay. Let's um, uh, before I get into the into the proof of that statement, let me talk a bit about um, give a bit of intuition maybe about about bounded miners. So here's the undirected graph and the vertex edge incidence matrix. So you could wonder what is the what is the highest miner you can find in that matrix? And of course, if the graph is bipartite, the corresponding matrix is TU, then the highest miner will be one. Uh, if it's not, then you could try to find odd cycles. Let me try to give an example here. So from this triangle here, it's an odd cycle. Let me mark two of them. So there are two vertex disjoint odd cycles. And so this clearly shows the graph is not bipartite, of course, but also reveals uh, a larger minor. So what you can do is look at the, at the vertex edge incidence matrix and just look at the minor corresponding to the red edges. So, the, so take the columns corresponding to red edges. That would be, um, uh, hope I don't do it wrong. And if, if I do it wrong, please let me know. It'd be one, two, three, and six, and seven, and nine. So those columns. And I look at the vertices that are incident with those edges. So this is vertex up to six, so one to six. So what you will see here is you will see, uh, if I look at this, at this sub matrix, so it's actually a block diagonal matrix because I chose two vertex disjoint triangles. This is one block of it, and that's the other block of it. This considers as being one three times three block, and all off-diagonal entries are, are zero. So of course, the, I mean, the determinant, you here have the instance matrix of a triangle. So it's determined it will be two or minus two, so it's two in absolute value. The same down here, so the, this minor I exhibited right now has, is an absolute value equal to four. More generally, you see that construction, if I had found like K vertex disjoint triangles, the minor would be in absolute value two to the K. And it turns out it's actually um, not just one possible way to find large minors, actually the, large, the largest minors look, look like that in that matrix. So, so the, the largest minor you can find in this incidence matrix is actually equal to two to the power of the so-called odd cycle packing number, which is really just what I did, which means how many triangles, how many odd cycles can you pack in a graph that are vertex disjoint. So it's a measure of how far you are away from a bipartite graph. And in particular, if the odd cycle packing number is one, then this matrix is totally bimodular. So totally means that all minors are between minus two and two. And this means that we can use our procedure to, um, uh, to optimize any ILP uh, over that constraint matrix. Uh, so with respect to that constraint matrix, in particular, we can find a maximum weight independent set for such graphs. So for graphs with odd cycle packing number one or, uh, or a minimum vertex cover. So actually those questions have been open. People studied the, studied the um, maximum dependent set problem in that context and the approximation algorithms are known, but even for the case of odd cycle packing number equal to one, it was not known how to get the maximum weight independent set uh, prior to our work. But this is many more results on, on small minors. And I'm gonna list just a few of them and just mention them briefly. I really don't have, uh, there's no way I could go into all, all those very, very nice works. So it's the odd cycle packing number I explained. It, it turns out that for, uh, if the odd cycle packing number is constant, you can actually, uh, you can actually recognize such graphs. That's a non-trivial procedure that's based on work of, uh, um, uh, of, uh, of Seymour and um, Robertson Seymour. And uh, also, if you have a polyhedron that's defined by a constraint matrix with bounded minors, it turns out one can show that first the diameter is small, and also there's actually a, a randomized simplex type algorithm that, that for solving uh, LPs over such polytopes. That's results by so by so the authors in particular so Fritz who is, who is here. Um, this results in computing largest minor. I said two of them, but there are many more. There also results in computing largest minor uh, under some additional constraints. And I think we'll later have a talk, I think, by Nishit this week that will also be about that topic. And, uh, and there's a very nice paper by, uh, by Hochbaum and, and Shanti Kumar showing that, uh, so it shows several things. It's essentially a framework they present. But if you have the, uh, the uh, implication for our setting to show that if you can solve, for example, a, a BIPs uh, optimally, or, or any ILP with some bound type of bounded minors, then you can even solve the same problem optimally if the objective is separable and convex. So if you can minimize the separable convex function, you can kind of use as a black box the algorithm and then replace the linear objective by a separable convex one. Rico? So the, the, the only difference between the general cases that here you're not allowed to <coughs> The general case? Um, like for general uh, matrices? I mean, it, uh, it, it, the BIP. Ah, I see. I mean, in a BIP, you can also have negative numbers. Right. So just, so just in this example, it's, it's, it's an incidence matrix uh, yeah. of an indirected graph. It's, it's, it turns out to be zero one, but that's, uh, that's really just the example that is, uh, has a property. That's nothing. It's not really uh, nothing to do with, uh, with the definition of a uh, of a bi matrix. Yeah. How hard is the proof of this? The largest minor being two to the power of. That's pretty simple, actually. 
that's very that's uh, relatively quick. I can I mean, if offline, I can, I can prove in in two or three minutes. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, um, good. Uh, more questions, maybe. Okay, perfect. Let's um, uh, let me t uh, tell you a bit more about the approach. So um, I want to explain the approach on a high level. So it's, it's a bit, if I want to, it's a lot of technicalities, and I try to, I try to sweep many of them under the rug. But, um, uh, but I would like to give you some of the main ingredients we need. Uh, so we start with, uh, uh, with a BIP you see over here. So that's a general BIP. You see the, um, so I typically assume it's a polytope because it'll be a polyhedron, a, an unbounded, uh, so it'll be unbounded. We've actually first solved the LP. Again, a vertex solution for the corresponding LP. And I will always assume that that vertex solution is, is not integral. I and mean, of course, if that is integral, I'm immediately done. So let's assume it's fractional. So it's half integral in that case. And then we will, we will first show we can reduce now the BIP to a different type of problem, which I like to call conic parity TU problem, or CPTU. So it's, again, it's an ILP uh, with some special structure. The constraint matrix T is TU. The right-hand side is zero. So in particular, it's a conic one. So the, the origin is tied with respect to all of the constraints. And of course, so far, that would, that would be easy. But there's one additional constraint which says that for some subset of the coordinates S, um, you have to be, if you sum up the values of Y over those coordinates, it should be odd. Let me give you an example. So you have a 2D example. Um, so the polyhedron is a, so a cone. Actually, that cone does, does come from a TU matrix. That's not hard to check. And let's assume that, that the set S is just the first coordinate. This means you want to optimize over the integer points in that cone, but not just any integer point. You want that the first coordinate is odd. So you want to optimize over, over the solid points I have in here. Because of that oddness constraint, the origin is not feasible. It's actually never feasible for those CTP, uh, CPTU problems. That's kind of important because the origin will correspond to the LP optimum. So we do want to cut off that solution. Good. So then having a CPTU problem, what it will do is we'll use seamless decomposition on this TO matrix T, the decomposition that allows you to um, uh, allows you to, okay, that's as far as it gets, um, allows you to decompose a TO matrix into simpler matrices. It's a purely structural result about TO matrices that was actually developed in the context of regular matroids. It was a topic that's uh, close to my heart, uh, matroid optimization. And, um, and then we'll show that not just can you, so you can use the decomposition not just to decompose the matrix, but actually I can decompose the problem itself as well along this decomposition. And I will get into that a little bit maybe at the end of the talk if, I, uh, if time permits. Um, Good. Okay, let me first start. How can you go from, from a BIP problem, so from a bimodular IP, to a, such a conic problem with a TO matrix? And again, I want to mostly highlight the main, uh, the main ideas. So there's, um, there's a key result by Veslov and Cherkov that says the following. Look at any, at any BIP. So essentially, just a result about the feasible set. So forget about the objective. Look at any BIP. Take any vertex. <laughs> so here, maybe it helps to imagine that this would be like an, an, an optimal LP solution, but, but it could be any vertex. Now, if you look at the tight constraints at that vertex, so this defines now a cone, and look at the integer hull of, of the points in that cone. Then it turns out, so this, this is now a polyhedron with some vertices. In this case, we have, uh, we have two vertices. It turns out that these vertices lie on edges of the relaxation, so on edges of the blue set, of the blue relaxation of the beginning. You might wonder, why should I even care about that? The, the point is that that's pretty powerful in the sense that for, it implies, in particular, that those vertices are feasible for all of the constraints. Because first they're integer, because I said it's the integer hull, so those are integer points. But moreover, they're in the blue set in the relaxation, so they fulfill all of the linear constraints. Therefore, they're feasible. So this means, essentially, you can, you can for example, solve this, also what we actually do. You can solve the LP, get a vertex, a vertex solution. Forget about all the other constraints that are not tight. Then you optimize, essentially, you optimize over the red set here, over the integer points in, uh, for the cone, or this is like the convex hull of those points. If you return a vertex, an optimal vertex solution to the new problem, you'll be done. Right? Because it'll be feasible for the original problem. And of course, the red set you have here is a relaxation of the original problem. So, so you'll be immediately be done if you can do that. So that's, um, uh, that's a, key, uh, a key result. Actually, you can forget about all constraints that are not tight under some mild conditions. You have to make sure you return a vertex solution. Yeah. So, Rico, isn't yes. the only hard part is that you could have a lot of degeneracy? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's the hard part, yeah. Right. Except, so this is the problem where I'm uh, we're non-degenerate, right? Then you could just look at all the, I mean, at the polynomially many or linear many, yeah, many rays and, and just check where the first integer point lies and, and return the best one. Exactly. Yeah. That's really about, uh, it's really about fighting degeneracies, yeah. Um, unfortunately, most combinatorial problems are highly degenerate. <laughs> 
Okay, so um, so far, so let me give you a second example just of that theorem. So let's pick another vertex. Let's look at the tight constraints. Let's look at the convex hull of the integer point. So that's this. So this time it's a cone, it doesn't need to be one. And there's one vertex, and that vertex is on an edge of the original relaxation. Just to give a second example. Good. Uh, okay, so um, uh, so let me just just sketch that, how we go to CP2. So we have an original BIP problem. I solve the LP, get a vertex V. I look at the tight constraints. Now I invoke Vasilov and Cherkov and, and throw away all the other constraints that are not tight. <coughs> then I, I end up here. So essentially I can assume I have a BIP problem that's conic. It's essentially what, uh, an easy way to explain that. Now what I will do is I will do column operations on the matrix to get a new system. And I'll do column operations such that I obtain an identity matrix on uh, somewhere in, in, in the constraints. And so this will actually correspond to do a, an affine transformation of, of the variable x into new variable y. And what one can show is, um, so then we, we, get a we first get a new system of type, uh, some new matrix times y smaller or equal zero. And one can show that this matrix is actually TU. It's kind of interesting. It follows from, uh, let me give you one property that could help you understand why this, this makes sense. As soon as we have a conic CP2 problem, uh, sorry, a conic uh, BIP problem, then if you take any full rank n times, take any n times n full rank submatrix, then its determinant has to be two or minus two because those constraints, assume it's full rank, they do define the vertex V. If the determinant was like one or minus one, I mean, I could just obtain V by inverting that matrix and multiplying with, with BQ, and then I would have an integer vertex. But I know that that V is not integer, so this cannot happen. There's a special structure we have here. So all the n times n minors are now actually not just between minus two and two, but they're minus two, zero, or two. That's an additional structure we didn't have beforehand. And this is actually what we can exploit to get a TU matrix. This is what, what, what explains that this will be a TU matrix. I don't have time to go into those details now. Okay, we still have to make sure now of the transformation, but we have to make sure that if we now optimize over those y's, that if I transform it back into x, that I get an integer point x, right? That's what I'm interested in. And it turns out if you, um, it's mostly just uh, some calculations, that the condition you need to, that y needs to fulfill that this holds is precisely a parity condition, and I will, I will skip this in the interest of time. So it turns out the condition you have to add is that for some subset of the, of the coordinates, uh, y of s has to be odd, so summing y over those coordinates has to be odd. But let me, um, uh, let me skip this. Okay, now I'd like to talk a little bit about Seamus theory decomposition in, that com uh, in the context. Let me start with uh, just a general explanation of what is Seamus theory decomposition. So, as I said, original is presented for regular matrices, but there's, a, there's like a very close relation between regular matrices and TU matrices. And so it turns out that any TU matrix can be decomposed into simpler matrices, simpler TU matrices, that are one of three types, either network matrices, so you can think of, I don't define them formally, but you can think of them as, as uh, directed incidence matrices of a graph. This is like one special case of a, of a network matrix and it's a slightly more general, uh, more general class or well, somewhat more general class. So some matrices you would see in a, in a flow problem. Uh, transposes they're off. So some matrices you would see in a, in a cut problem. And these two very special five times five matrices. And so the way you can get down to those simple matrices is by a set of operations, which are listed here. Again, I don't want to go into all of them. Some are very, very simple operations, like you can permute rows and columns, you can negate row or column. Um, but the most, maybe among the more interesting ones are sums. We have one, two, and three sums. And maybe you can try to explain it here. So if you have a TU matrix that can, such that you can reorder rows and columns in a way that, that you feel like, an almost block diagonal matrix. Let me explain the two sum. So you have like two matrices on the, on the blocks, and, but you still have a rank one matrix here in an off diagonal block. Then we say a two, so a two sum is defined as, uh, if you rewrite this matrix as LA, so where A is yeah, as defined on the right hand side and D transpose R. So we say that this is a, the two sum of these two terms is then this, this almost block diagonal matrix. And um, similarly, a three sum does a similar operation where you have two rank one matrices on the off diagonal blocks. And the one sum is a very trivial. Uh, composition into a, an actually uh, an, a diagonal block, a block diagonal matrix. Um, so important here is that, so similar also, I mean, one can actually easily, quite easily see that if this matrix is TU, then both sums to the, on the left hand side are TU as well, and vice versa. And that's true for all those sums. So actually what people also use this for, this TU decomposition, is that one can uh, recognize or one can, one can prove that the matrix is TU in case you also give an efficient certificate by using a TU decomposition. And therefore you want to make sure that whenever you decompose, you um, preserve the units. That was kind of one of the initial, one of the motivations in the context of the units. Good. 
Let me one more operation that's kind of in important is you can do pivoting. Pivoting is kind of, think of simplex pivoting. Now let's skip the other ones for, uh, yeah, which are relatively simple. Okay, this is really just a structural theorem, but I want to do it and uh, I want to kind of use this in the context of, of CPTU problems. But let me first explain, so how, how does such a decomposition now look like? So again, let's forget about the simpler operation. Let's just assume we have only one, two, three sums and, and pivoting that we need. So you get a TO matrix and you can actually, there's some tree, some decomposition tree that looks like that. So there may be first the three sum that decomposes the matrix into T5 and T9. So the three sum of T5, T9 is T. Then if you, if you keep pivoting on T9, on, on T9, you get T8, which in turn can again be decomposed with a three sum. So it looks somehow like that. And the leaves you have here, so this would be T1, T2, T6, T7, and T4. So these all except for the root. There would be one of those three types explained beforehand. So network matrices transposes there off or one of the two constant size matrices. So what we will show is the following. We will show that if you can solve a CPTU problem with constraints, the kind of CPTU problems, they kind of can, um, solution procedures can propagate bottom up. So first we show that actually for the base blocks, for those three types of matrices, we can solve CPTU problems efficiently if the constraint matrix of the CPTU problem is one of the, of the three base block types of TU matrices. We also show that for any one, two, three sum, if you have an efficient procedure for any CPTU problem on the matrix TA and one for TB, then we can get one for TC, so for the three sum of, or, or for the K sum of them, where K is one, two, or three. The same for pivoting. So this is kind of a, an easy, kind of a high level simplified way of explaining that. There's still a bunch of caveats one has to watch out for. One is, it's not just sufficient to say that if you have an efficient procedure for CPTU with respect to TA and TB, that you get one for TC, because maybe the, uh, the computational time will increase by a factor of n, potentially. And this decomposition can actually be kind of non-constant depth. So this, is, this will not lead to an efficient algorithm for CPTU for, for T on top. So when someone has to make sure we need something stronger than just saying that you have efficient procedures below, then you can get an efficient one for the next one, for, for a one, two, or three sum. Good. Um, let me give you some details of, of how, we, um, uh, how we do that. Let's just look at a two sum. So let me just remind you of, of where we are and what a two sum is and, and what I want to do. So we have, we're given a CPTU problem. Here, again, T is a TO matrix, the right-hand side is zero, and we have some, some parity constraint. And let's assume that T can be written as a two sum. So T can be written as some LA two sum B transpose R. And this means it's, a, it's an almost block diagonal matrix with a rank one, uh, one matrix T on the, on the top right. So, uh, so the, the, the components in which we have to be odd, they can kind of be split into a left part and the right part. We'll call this the SL the left part and SR the right part. And when you now look at that problem, it's somehow, it's nice that it has an almost block diagonal structure because that would somehow decompose the problem into the left variables and the right variables, right? Because there's almost no interaction. And there's just two types of interactions we have. One of them is for oddness on the set S, right? If, the, if you, sort of kind of think, you can think of, an, of a solution to the problem as consisting of XL of a left part and the solution, I mean, of this problem here, of XR, like the components corresponding to the right part. So you have to make sure that, that if XL is odd on SL, then XR is even on SR and, or vice versa, right? So there's like some interaction here. And the only other interaction we have is the rank one matrix up here. But that's, that's it. Yeah. So what we show is, we show that actually there exists an optimal solution to the CPTU problem that has the following property. Uh, if it so can decompose into left and right again, we can think of it that way. We can show that the scalar product of, of B with the right part is minus one, zero, one. So, so why is this useful? If I told you this is the, if I told you what that scalar product is, let's say I tell you it's one then there's no interaction anymore between left and right part here because you know what the, um, uh, I mean, you know how to modify, for example, the left problem, you know what the, what the impact is of the right problem on those constraints up here because they only depend on that scalar product and nothing else, right? So this sounds nice. So it seems like we can kind of, there are kind of like six options we could guess. There's like three options for, for um, uh, what that scalar product is and there's two options on whether uh, the right part is odd on SR and the left one even on SL or, or the other way around. Of course, a simple procedure would be just enumerate those six options and solve the left and right part independently. This would indeed lead to an efficient procedure for the problem up here if you can solve the left and right part independently. But it turns out here you have a, you have a problem because uh, seamless theory decomposition does not really, um, and doesn't give you a lot of guarantees in, uh, about how, those, how big those matrices L and R are, I mean, how, how balanced they are. They could be extremely unbalanced. This could be that 
uh, if it's such an imbalanced case where L is almost a whole matrix and R is a two times two matrix. In this case, you definitely do not want to solve a CPU problem with like six CPU problems on the, on the matrix L because they're almost the same size as the original problem. So this would lead to, again, now we would fall into that trap I explained beforehand that if you then propagate things up, this will not be polynomial time. So actually, also need to tweak a little bit Seymour's studio composition to make sure we have properties we need. Um, good. So what we do is the following. Let's assume that the right part is the smaller part, in the sense maybe that the right matrix has the smaller number of, of rows. We kind of measure, measure the size in terms of rows, but there's different ways to do that. Then what we would do is we would, we would look at the six options of the scalar product and the odd even version and only solve the right problem for all those six options. The so problem is it is at most half as large as the, uh, as the original one. So this we can afford, actually. And once we solve those six, got six solutions, we actually, uh, we will show that you can now uh, redesign a new, you can build up a new problem on the left part that incorporates those solutions from the right part and solves the left part just once, which avoids that issue of, of having exploding uh, complexity. So that also skipped this in the interest of time. And so, um, uh, so the main message is clear. You can solve uh, BIPs efficiently, actually even in strongly polynomial time. Um, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of interesting open questions, in my opinion. Um, first, we cannot recognize bimodular matrices or totally bimodular matrices. So if you give me a bimodular matrix, and then I can solve any ILP over it, but I can still not tell you whether you gave me a bimodular matrix. It's kind of a, of a strange phenomenon. Um, so we, um, uh, of course, a big open question is, can you solve k modular ILPs? What about if the minors are bigger than two, maybe a constant k? Can we still, still solve them efficiently? So even for k equals three, that's open. Uh, sorry, Fritz. Yeah. Your algorithm, if, it, uh, if it's going through, even if the matrix is not bimodular, it's giving you a correct answer. Yeah, I mean, it gives an answer, right? And you can see, um, uh, then essentially, you can, uh, you can check whether the answer is, is uh, I mean, something would go wrong if, uh, if the matrix is, uh, if you give me a bad matrix. Yeah. Would yeah. I mean, not, the point is that, I mean, you could give me uh, a non-bimodular matrix, but uh, they're different, but it could maybe it will still give an optimal solution, right? This can happen. I mean, one, one reason could just be that if I solve the LP and look at the cone that is tight there, may, maybe this part is bimodular and the non-bimodularity was somewhere outside, but there could be many other reasons for, for this would of course not be a big issue, but there are many other reasons that, that could, um, it could appear, yeah. So we don't know, um, that really doesn't imply much. The algorithm doesn't imply much in terms of recognition. Um, so higher sub, higher uh, higher case interesting. I mean, even just determine feasibility. If I give you a, like a three modular ILP, <laughs> uh, just tell me whether it's feasible or not. I've, uh, I think no one knows how to uh, uh, how to answer that question. Um, and uh, so, so it turns out what we did is we somewhat reduced the K modular ILP, the two modular or, or bi modular ILPs to actually so-called modular optimization problems. Like I said at the beginning, this submodular minimization with parity constraints. Because what we do is we go, we broke things down in this CMOS studio composition to base blocks, to base matrices, and those problems are extremely combinatorial. And then we can actually use combinatorial procedures to to the, like the, the main work. And uh, it would be nice to see can we get a similar reduction for higher K. So it turns out that. Um, so, so, so for higher k, you would have problems that at least capture pro constraints of this type, where you want to be, for example, one mod k for, uh, on some coordinates. But I don't know a reduction that goes both ways. Certainly, does such problems will appear. You have to be able to solve them, but I'm not sure if you can solve them, whether you could solve any, any kind of other LP. Actually, we can extend some, some independent work with Martin Nagel and Benny Sudakov. We, we can extend the result that you can efficiently solve, efficiently minimize submodular functions over a parity constraint. We can show you can even efficiently minimize them over any constraint of type that the cardinality is, is k mod p, where p is a constant prime power. So it's kind of a, this does extend kind of the, of the, the world and, and the constraint types over which you can efficiently minimize submodular functions and may be useful for that question. It would be nice to have a different approach than uh, for solving BIPs that it's not based on CMOS theory composition. I mean, first, of course, it's, it's certainly slow, but also structurally, it would be nice to have a, an approach that is, um, and that, uh, that is different. Uh, so one thing we can exclude, so that's uh, other work with, um, uh, with Alfonso Javales and Stefan Weltke, we can show that actually BIPs, if you look at the convex hull of the, the integer hull, so they can have a very high extension complexity. And actually, even, even just a cone, a BIP cone, can have a high extension complexity. So I mean, the integer hall of, of, uh, of a BIP cone. So this is certainly not, uh, such an approach will certainly not work out to try to find uh, a small description. We can actually even show something more. We can even show that even if you have, you're even allowed to use 
up to almost square uh, square root log n, uh, square root n many integer variables in your in your um, uh, uh, in your extended description, and even then you're not able to describe it with with a small number of uh, of constraints. So maybe somehow when you see a parity constraint, you might think, yeah, maybe you could use integer variables, a few of them, and could describe it. So this will not work out. And it would be nice to have maybe additional structural properties of k-modular matrices. So there's a lot of, of questions open there. Okay, thank you very much. That's all I wanted to say. So when, what, what do you know? When, when does it start to be NP-hard in terms of the largest subdetermined? So, so it has a function mm -hmm. in the dimension, number of variables. What do you um, know? I mean, yeah, so it's, um, uh, it's certainly at any, for any constant epsilon, if the minors are n to the power of epsilon, then it's certainly NP-hard. Um, I don't know of any, anything stronger than that, but also didn't, didn't try that hard to prove anything stronger than so that. So log n, for example, is not known. It's not known, yeah. But potentially can improve the bound, yeah. So you assume that the, for the R cycle pattern number, it's a constant that you, like all the color is uh, one that you can solve as two, right? Yeah. But do you get also a min-mass relationship in that case? Or does table set problem? Or such, such a relationship is, is already known for, um, uh, we, we don't get that, but it's known from, uh, from other work, yeah. There's an old result by, I think, Lovers and but that's, I think that's not written up. Uh, for, for the for the odd cycle pack number of one, and then there's this uh, Kabarabayashi and, and Reed paper that actually uh, shows it for any constant uh, any constant odd cycle packing number. It's, quite, it's uh, pretty interesting stuff. Yeah. Uh. More questions? So let's thank you again. Thank you.